Episode 25 of the Wild Fed Podcast, How to Raise a Fish. Stocking Salmonids with Tim Nedler is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Now's a crucial opportunity for building a robust and well-educated immune system. At some point, these lockdowns will lift, and many of us will have our immunity challenged in new ways. Make sure to leave the lockdown with a stronger immune system than you started with. Now through April 16th, take 10% off colostrum and chaga extract with promo code IMMUNE19, that's IMMUNE19, at surthrival.com. Chaga has demonstrated powerful immune-modulating activity. You can find a scientific literature review on Chaga on the Surthrival website. I'm a huge believer in the power of Chaga. In fact, you can see me harvesting and making medicine with Chaga in episode 8 of the Wild Fed TV show. Sir Thrival's colostrum is an immune-fortifying functional food that I use daily in my blended drink. Actually, I use a decoction of chaga as the base for that drink, and then I blend colostrum into it. It is really delicious, in addition to being immunofortifying. Now, I've mentioned several times a study hosted on PubMed called Prevention of Influenza Episodes with Colostrum Compared with Vaccination in Healthy and High-Risk Cardiovascular Subjects. The following is from that study's abstract, quote, Colostrum, both in healthy subjects and high-risk cardiovascular patients, is at least three times more effective than vaccination to prevent flu and is very cost-effective, close quote. Colostrum has long been used to create a robust immune system. Now through Thursday, April the 16th, take 10% off colostrum and chaga extract with promo code IMMUNE19 at surthrival.com. Would you like to see the Wild Fed TV show? Head over to wild-fed.com to see episode one on the river floodplain for free. If you like the episode and want to see more, you can use the coupon code HUNKERDOWN for 25% off season one or the season one and director's cut bundle package. Season one on its own is just over four hours of premium TV and the director's cuts are an additional 14 hours of content. In those, we go through the episode itself, as well as the equipment and strategies you see in the show. Again, go over to wild-fed.com to see episode one for free and to get the links to the Vimeo pages where you can use the coupon code HUNKERDOWN for 25% off. This is an ideal time to watch the season or the individual episodes, especially with the upcoming hunting, fishing, and foraging seasons all about to begin. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to the Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed, food is all around you. Well, for several years now, I've been curious about fish stocking programs. What are they and how do they work? I'd heard some pretty bad rumors about their practices, the product they produce, and in particular that they can sometimes have negative impacts on natural fisheries. Much of what I heard, though, was stories and opinions of other anglers, and much of that had been repeated and passed down for decades. A lot of what I read was about the early days of the programs, which started less than a decade after the Civil War. I had no real information about what they do now or how they operate today. So I decided rather than just repeating the speculations of those around me, I'd go visit one. Not just tour it, but sit down and interview the supervisor and even get out to help him stock some fish. Today's show is the interview that I conducted that day. Now, it's no mystery to our regular listeners that I prefer to chase and eat genetically wild fish. It's just part of a broader worldview, one that I espouse each week on this show. That ethos is where the name Wild Fed came from. It's a mindset and a way of engaging with the world. That said, I live in the more populated southern half of Maine where many of our waters are heavily stocked, and I'm routinely asked by people who reach out from all around the country about the quality of stocked fish. People want to know, can they or should they eat these fish? Do they really taste like liver? An often repeated story based on the rumors that these fish are fed liver pellets. People want to know, how are they raised? What are the practices? And just what exactly do they really feed these hatchery-raised fish? Well, the answers to these questions and many more are the subject of this interview, and a lot of those answers really surprised me. Having had some time to digest the interview itself, as well as the visit to the hatchery, and having stocked now a couple thousand brook trout, I've got a few reflections that I'll share. Then you can have a listen and decide for yourself. Really though, I highly encourage you to visit a hatchery where you live so you can see for yourself, as I'm sure there are regional differences from what you're going to hear in this interview. Catching and eating hatchery-raised fish 
at least the ones that were coming out of Tim's hatchery, is, in my opinion, as good, though probably a lot better, than eating farmed fish. After all, these fish are born and raised in the hatchery setting, but then go out to spend time in natural ecosystems, eating their biologically appropriate diets of insects and other invertebrates, as well as other fish, and catching them is a lot more fun than buying farm-raised fish at the supermarket. Now, does that mean I'll turn my back on wild salmonids in favor of catching hatchery fish? No, not likely. But it does make me feel a lot better about it when I do catch them. I'm also glad not to be repeating ill-informed urban legends about the fish tasting like liver. Spoiler alert, these hatchery fish are eating the same food that aquaculture fish are. No liver pellets required, and no, they do not taste like liver. So here's where I currently stand in all of this. Hatcheries and hatchery-raised fish are a reality of our current fisheries, and without them, there would be far less angling opportunities for salmonids, particularly in highly populated parts of the country. That's neither an endorsement nor a repudiation. There is a lot of complexity here, ranging from the ecological to the economic, the cultural to the genomic. But I believe in being adapted to my environment, and my environment includes stocked fish. So I want to be educated about them. I want to know where they come from, what they eat, and when they were put in the water. I want to be able to recognize them so that I know whether the fish I'm looking at is wild or if it was raised in a fish run. Often, I set out for places that I know were never stocked, specifically seeking genetically wild fish. Other times, like in the ice fishing season, I'll target hatchery-born landlocked salmon, and yes, I eat them. It's become less of an either-or proposition and more about environmental awareness. This interview left me reflecting on how these hatchery fish occupy a space that's somewhere between wild and farmed. Maybe the closest analogy would be something like hunting and eating a feral hog that had escaped a farm when it was young. It started out in artificial conditions, but then naturalized itself to a wild environment. Now, that said, if you were to go out and fish right after the hatchery vehicle had just deposited 300 trout in the stream, you could conceivably catch fish that had never even eaten a wild meal. Or, as is the case with a lot of the ice fishing that I do, you could let these hatchery fish hold over for a while and catch them after they've been naturalized to wild waters for weeks, months, or even years. In fact, I like to check the hatchery stocking reports online so I know if the place I plan to fish has been stocked recently. If so, I prefer to wait. That said, many other folks want to be there as soon as the truck pulls away. So I guess, like many things in life, it's all about your preferences and knowing what it is you're after. So whether you use the information in this interview to target hatchery fish or to avoid them, I think you'll find it all very enlightening. I left feeling much better about the hatchery system than I did before. Tim is very proud of the fish he raises and the practices they employ, and I can't say I blame him. I trust that you'll come away with your own conclusions. In fact, you can let me know what you think on my Instagram pages at Daniel Vitalis or at wild.fed, or you can leave a comment on the blog associated with this interview at wild-fed.com. I'll be looking forward to your thoughts. Just don't ask me if they taste like liver. Tim Nedler is the fish culture supervisor at the New Gloucester State Fish Hatchery of Maine's Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and he oversees the facility's annual production of 60,000 catchable fish, including brown trout, brook trout, and rainbow trout. A passionate fisherman and hunter, Tim also teaches hunter safety courses for Maine's Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Welcome back to Wild Fed. I'm here with my producer, Grant Giuliano, and we are here with Tim Nedler today, fish hatchery supervisor. Um, Tim, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do here and uh, what this place is all about. Yeah. Hey, thanks, you guys, for coming here today. Uh, uh, what this place is all about is we're one of eight fish hatcheries that are located throughout the state of Maine. Um it's a great place to stop by and, and uh, see if you can come and take a tour. But why we're here is to actually go out and stock fish. Uh, that's something that we're going to get to do today. It's going to be a, be a little special treat. Um, and what we're doing is we're actually increasing the recreational opportunity for folks to go out there and be able to catch the product that we stock. And the fish hatcheries are under Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife? That's right. Yep. Under the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Okay. Uh, there's eight different fish hatcheries located throughout the state of Maine. Yep. And your man, what's the mandate for, like, what is the mission statement for the hatcheries? And are the hatcheries their own, are, is it like a department in Inland Fish and Wildlife? Um, 
are they ta that you're tasked with something separate from I guess what the rest of the department does so yeah what, what is it you guys are tasked with that's right we're we're under the fisheries division okay. uh, and in that division you have two sections so there's the hatchery section which is the section that I work for and then there's also the fishery section um, so the differences between the two sections are hatcheries are just that. So um, right from the very first, uh, you know, egg take in the fall, uh, we raise those fish. We get them up to a suitable size to stock those fish. Uh, that means to transport them from the hatcheries to the receiving waters. Uh, so we, we keep our, our fish from anywhere from a year to uh, two years. Uh, we also have brood stock, so those are the parents to these fish, and uh, we stock those typically at three-year-old fish. Um, so it's all that. It's, it's the maintenance of the facility that we have here. Uh, it's the daily care and raising of the fish that we have on site. Uh, and when I say fish, I'm talking salmonids. Mm -hmm. So a, a salmonid is a trout or a salmon. Um, our choice of species is uh, somewhat dictated by what we have for a water supply. So uh, our hatchery right here, we raise mostly brown trout, but we also have brook trout. We have rainbow trout as fry. Uh, other facilities, such as the facility over in Casco, in addition to having those types of fish, they also have salmon. Okay. Um, that has to do with their water temperature, to, water quality? Uh, absolutely. All, all those things factor into it. So... Uh, you know, you, you have those eight places located throughout the state where you can raise these fish, and each one has obviously a unique water supply. Uh, some are stream-fed, such as our location right here in New Gloucester. Some are fed by a lake. Uh, some are fed by a spring, such as Dry Mills, the, the fish hatchery that's attached to the main wildlife park. A lot of folks have been there. Uh, so that kind of goes to say, well, what is the, the uh, ideal species that you could raise at, at that facility? Um, so to compare, compare hatcheries to uh, fisheries, uh, the fisheries biologists, uh, their, their job is to also go out and, and check and see how things are doing in the wild. Um, so perhaps you've been ice fishing mm -hmm. and uh, a gentleman or, or a lady comes along dressed in an IFNW uniform. Immediately you think that they're a game <laughs> warden. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, and they may be, but uh, a lot of times it's, it's our fishery staff that's out there doing a creel survey. Okay. Um, and what they're looking for is... Creel being that old word for the bag that people would kind of carry around or the little box they'd have that they'd keep their catch in, correct? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, the, that's the lingo. So a, a creel survey is to see what did you actually catch that day. Yeah. Uh, and they will go and weigh and measure fish, um, perhaps check the stomach contents, uh, you know, basic questions, how's the fishing, that type of thing, to get a handle on how the fishery is mm -hmm. actually performing. I want to actually, let me back it up a little bit, because you'd made the comment, sometimes people think it's the warden. And this is an interesting piece for me. I, I'm going to talk more about this with you in a minute, but I'm an adult onset hunter and fisher. So I, I don't have, there's a lot I don't know as a result of that, but, but an advantage is I'm not encumbered with a lot of the kind of stories that people have or prejudices that they have from the past that have kind of gotten carried on. One is that I didn't come into fishing or hunting with this like fear of wardens. And of course I don't like getting um, pulled over by cops. So I understand why it's not fun to get stopped by a warden, but the way I came into it was from more of the conservation perspective. So my understanding has been that as an angler, as a hunter, I'm working in participation with the department, um, in a whole bunch of ways. And what I am able to harvest provides information to the department, which helps them do better management, right? So that's just an interesting thing I want to point out there that sometimes, like you said, it would be somebody from the fishery coming to look at what you've caught. And that data actually helps overall, you know, understand how well the, the effort is going to, I guess, support the recreational fishery, right? That's right. Uh, the, the whole resource and, and what I mean by resource is, is, uh, you know, let's, let's limit it just to, to, uh, fish and, and, uh, uh, but you, you need to include wildlife as well. So it's shared, um, meaning if you woke up this morning and saw a deer in your backyard, you don't own that deer any more than the next person does. Uh, 
that's one of the great things about this country and uh, how we manage our wildlife. So it's a shared use of the natural resource. And it's really a critical job of a game warden to protect that. Um, if you do something intentionally in violation of the law, uh, not only are you doing that, but you're also harming everybody else. They're technically so stealing. You're, you're yeah. really stealing because you're decreasing uh, somebody else's opportunity to, to share that same wildlife, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's fish, fish or wildlife. Um, so distinctly different from the European model, right? Where I think, if, as I understand it, I'm not an expert on that, but as I understand it, landowners have rights over the animals on their on the game on their land right big time so it's it's almost like you know it's in a fence over there mm -hmm. and uh we're so fortunate and the system it's quite complex but it works you mm -hmm. know it benefits the wildlife it benefits all the folks that uh get to enjoy those natural resources that we have uh another thing i, I wanted to mention too when you were talking about uh getting into this at at a uh, you know an older age, a, a, not, ri a ripe old age, <laughs> <laughs> not uh, not necessarily mid, starting mid thirties. I mean, pretty pretty advanced, I'd say, in age. Sure. Given you know that a lot of people start when they're kids. Sure, uh, and and it's funny too because you were you were talking about you know some of the stories and and that uh, we still hear people say, oh geez, I don't want to eat those hatchery fish because they taste like liver. Mm -hmm. You're that uh, all the time. It's been. Geez, I don't know. Prior to 1950 uh, <laughs> was when the last time was that uh, you couldn't go out, you know, and you couldn't buy a commercially prepared fish meal, a diet for for fish. Uh, so you had to make your own. That was, of course, way before I started. And, um, but what it was, how it was done back then is uh, organ meats from, uh, you know, cattle and pigs and sheep yeah. were ground up and to include livers uh, and fed to the, to the trout and salmon that we were raising. Um, I don't know if they ever really did taste like liver. I really uh, I'm, I'm very I, suspicious I'm of that suspicious, idea. I'm suspicious of that as well. Uh, since that point in time, so say 1950 forward, uh, the diet that we actually feed our fish now is is a real high quality fish food. Uh, it, in fact, uh, you know, a lot of times when somebody might say that, I'll, I'll say, "Well, have you recently gone to a, a local grocery store and and purchased a salmon fillet that was raised in an ocean pen?" Uh, because they use the same feed companies that we use. So if they're already eating that product, uh, you know, it's 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 complete. It's a hundred percent diet. Uh, it's it's they don't taste like liver. I was surprised <laughs> to learn last time we were here that you don't use any antibiotics. Right. Uh, and, and we're very fortunate that we don't have to do that. You know, in, in this day and age, uh, uh, a lot of the news that you hear about commercial uh, farming and, and agriculture is, is all about, you know, what's not natural. Um, antibiotics or uh, GMOs or, you know, all the bad things that are happening out there. Um, we're really fortunate that we, we don't use any antibiotics. We don't, uh, have any genetically modified, uh, animals, organisms. Um, it's pretty much as natural as it can be. Um, yeah. i I was really won over at our last visit here. Uh, so we came, what was a few weeks ago just to get a tour. I was like pretty much on the fence on this issue because I, there's definitely a lot of negative press in the direction of the hatcheries these days that you, I hear from one side and then I hear really positive stuff from the other side. And I've, I, I just was kind of like, mm, I was skeptical. Mm -hmm. And then when we saw the place, it was not what I was expecting. Yeah. And then when I saw the water supply and the food quality, what I realized was that the quality of fish you guys are producing is on par with or probably better than most of the fish people are buying that have been farmed in the supermarket, right? right? Like it's being raised in somewhat similar, I, I imagine, a fashion initially, but then it actually goes out into the environment where it gets out in natural waters and eats natural feed and all of that. I was just thinking like that if somebody is, was going to buy, like you mentioned, salmon would be a great example, Atlantic salmon, which is all farmed fish. 
Um, it's not really any different than if you went out and caught one, except that you get to go be part of that experience and participate in the conservation effort and all that. So, yeah, I was really impressed. I thought we were going to see all kinds of shady things going on. <laughs> that, was gonna, that was going to smell bad. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, I know like, a, like, a, like a high intensity cattle farm or like a high yeah. intensity chicken farm or something. Yeah. No, but it's a really cool setup here. It, it, it really is. And, and uh, we take a lot of pride in the product that we produce as well. So I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I, I like to eat fish. I like to fish. Uh, I would have no problem eating a fish that we just stocked mm-hmm. here. Um, you know, my, my wife, my kids, uh, that's, it's all good. Um, do you ever do that? Oh, for sure. You know, and, and there's nothing more frustrating than going to a place that you just stocked fish, meaning you just put a whole bunch of nice, big, fat brook trout in there. And for whatever reason, they won't bite. <laughs> it's, it's one thing. I put to, you in here. Yeah. It's one I thing. I raised you. I clothed you. <laughs> right. Right. You know, uh, it, it's one thing to look at the stocking report. Uh, great source of information. You can check that out if you go to the IFNW website and look for fish stocking report um it it tells you how many fish were stocked there what the date was what the species was and approximately how long they were uh then you go there and perhaps you don't catch any fish and you think hmm i I wonder you know did they did they really not stock here or was there some error no it's it's real information it's it's accurate information um but when you stock them yourself, you know darn well they're right there. You know, you just put them in there, <laughs> right. say, that morning or the day before. And perhaps you can even see them, but they just won't bite. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, though, it's great. You know, uh, I, I've been out uh, stocking fish, and as we were offloading our truck into the body of water, things were just right. It was one of those magical moments when the water temperature on the truck was just right compared to the receiving water. Um, you know, it's, it's usually happens around mid May when, when things are just ideal, when, when, uh, the black flies and mosquitoes are really, really bad outside. <laughs> that's when the fishing tend to yeah, bite the, be the best. The yeah. fish t- tend to bite the best. Um, but sometimes things are perfect and folks can catch fish as we're stalking, you know, and, uh, it, that's great. It's, it's, it's all about that. Um, why not, especially in this day and age, try to foster that recreational opportunity mm-hmm. uh, for folks to get outside and, uh, you know, just just have an awesome time. Um, it, it's a great program. It really is. W- the background of it's something I'd love to chat about a little bit. And <clears throat> I want to say, like, I want to imagine that the audience is somebody who's going to hear this as somebody like me who um, I think we're speaking not so much to people who've grown up doing this stuff. They don't really – they already – got their information sources, but I think more for people who are coming into this later in the game and a lot of times because they have an interest in food and maybe they have an interest in nature and food, right? So that was me. I, I hiked, I rock climbed, I did some mountaineering. I spent a lot of time on the ocean. I did all these like outdoor pursuits. I didn't hunt or fish. Then I really was into food. So it was like, I'd go to nice restaurants. I'd go to the farmer's markets, you know, I'd spend all this money on really high quality food. So I'd be doing both of these pursuits, not realizing that if I merged the two, uh, I could get all the food right out there, you know? Right. Um, that's kind of how what led me here. But coming into that world, not having a mom and dad who hunted or fished, I didn't know about so many of the things that exist and have existed for a while. And hatcheries would be a great example. So I start fishing, I start hearing this thing about hatchery fish versus wild fish, and I don't really know what anyone's talking about yet. You know, I do a little research, and it's like, oh, this is this thing that's been going on for a long time. Um, it's had highs and lows and, and public interest and the public forgetting and all these, you know, there's all these stories, um, that the average person coming into this stuff might not know about. So how far can you back us up to like, where does this idea of fish hatcheries come from and, and how did it start? Cause I, I think if, if people heard, like suddenly you heard that they were raising deer up and releasing them and the deer you're hunting were like raised in a pen somewhere, that would be like, Whoa, that'd be a shock because maybe in the way that. Until you know about forestry, you might think all the woods here have always been here since Columbus came and no one's ever touched them. And uh, you don't realize, hey, this has probably been a field before 20 different times and it's grown back up. Maybe you assume all the fish in the water were born there and maybe they weren't. Right. So what is what is the backstory? Yeah, there's a there's a huge backstory. Uh, Many, many years, a lot of history. You know, we're talking uh, back to the 1880s. Wow. Uh, Yeah. So a long, long time. And, uh, you know, it 
when you think about that, it, it puts things in perspective that even back then, so uh, they realized that there wasn't enough fish available if you only relied on what Mother Nature produced. Um, so that everybody could go out and recreate and, you know, have a real good chance of, of uh, catching a fish. Um, so they, they started with a, with a program, a stocking program. Uh, and what that does is it enhances your ability to, to go out there and actually catch a fish. Um, we only stock salmonids. Uh, we don't do any warm water fish. Um, and a lot of times they, they need a little help to be in sufficient numbers that, uh, you would consider that fishing ex experience a good time. So uh, a lot of a lot of time, uh, a lot of research has been devoted into doing just that. And you know, there's nothing better than, and it's a cliche, but everybody's heard the the slogan, you know, hooked on fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's there's nothing better than seeing somebody catch their first fish, and you know, to plant that seed and um, talk about a great pastime that yeah. you can enjoy if you're you know, two years old or 102 years old, uh, anybody can do it. Um, I totally agree with you, and it's becoming a, a problem. I also uh, uh, teach hunter safety. I'm a hunter safety oh, instructor okay. for IFNW, where you're seeing folks nowadays that weren't brought up into that culture. Mm -hmm. And there's so many little things that you kind of just take for granted when you are, yep. that you, you know, every year you pick something up, and, and this is the case. Um, so uh, I, I get it. It's uh, you know it's a daunting task when uh, when you look at the law summary and try to figure out okay you know I, I want to be 100% legal, um, but you might have some questions and and uh, what I really really suggest, if it's at all possible, is to get some type of mentor. Mm -hmm. um, it could even be a friend that has the same interest level, but maybe not the experience, and go at it together. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, then you're going to figure out not only the, the rules, but also you're going to figure out the little tips and tricks that make it really successful when you do go out. Um, that, that, those rule books the first year is so overwhelming. And then after a while, because there's the core stuff that doesn't change too much, and then the peripheral stuff that changes a lot. But it takes a couple of years to get comfortable with with sort of a, a decent knowledge base of what's in there. I mean, it's... I, I think, you know, again, if you'd grown up with it, then you'd have learned a lot of those laws through osmosis, just what people were doing and then, you know, flicking through the book over the years. But yeah, the first time you come into it, it's like, it feels like you're studying for a bar exam or something. Yeah. It's, it's overwhelming. It's, it's a lot. It, it really is a lot of information. And, uh, you know, advice I can give to somebody is uh, try to concentrate on a, on a specific thing to begin with, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, with um, whether it's uh, one, one type of fish that you want to try to catch, like say you, perhaps you've never caught a brook trout, uh, you know, just concentrate on that, learn what the rules are for brook trout, learn the places to go, good, good places, uh, you know, there's a wealth of information on our website, our IFNW website. Uh, so it, you know, teamwork like that is, is tremendously beneficial. And, and when you're out there and you do see a game warden or a fisheries biologist or uh, one of us that works for the fish hatcheries, uh, you know, if you get a question, ask. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we'll all, uh, uh, we, we all want to encourage folks to utilize the resource. Uh, so I think we're all very forthcoming with information That's what I that found. can help. That's what I found. I do think there's a generation of people who saw themselves in opposition to the department. And so you, I'll, we still, like, we know some folks that are sort of hangers on to that attitude that it's like a, it's like a us versus them and the warden's always out to get you. And, and I came into it being like, oh, okay, that's the landscape of this thing. And then really quickly realized that all my interactions with wardens and with the biologists have been fantastic. And in what, one of the things that I appreciate about it is there's a real um, encouragement towards success where when you deal with other hunters and anglers, they can be kind of tight lipped about things, understandably, but the department does seem really invested in people um, getting access and um, having success, which is really nice. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's what it's all about. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention that you, that you brought up was, uh, trying to complete the circle of, uh, of food from mm -hmm. everything we've been, yeah. we've been talking about as well. Uh, to me, there's, there's nothing better than the more effort you can put into something 
or the more effort it takes to be successful, to me is a big measure of how successful it was. You know, in other words, <clears throat> if it didn't take any effort to do something and you go and do it, how good do you feel yeah. about it at the end of yeah. the day? Yeah. But if you get into fly tying, for instance, and you tie your own fly, then perhaps you might want to build your own fly fishing rod. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of time in, in there. It, not a lot of money necessarily, but a lot, of, a lot of time in that. And then you go out and you start to learn, you know, a particular body of water and you're fortunate you catch a fish that day um you, you're within the the rules and you bring that fish home uh and you cook it and you eat it you know that's that's a whole bunch of little things that had to go just mm -hmm. right in order to make it successful um but you you realize you know what a reward that was yeah. uh to instead of just going to the supermarket and would it be cheaper of course you know i mean <laughs> yeah, what's, saying, what's it cost for to go buy a salmon fillet i, I yeah, have no idea a, you know a few pounds and it's expensive uh, it, maybe six bucks or yeah. something like that yeah. um it would be way less expensive yeah. um to do it that way but it wouldn't be as satisfying as a word I'm looking for. You were just mentioning before we started recording that you guys do a little bit of maple syrup every year. We and do. That, that's one where, I mean, when you run the numbers on it, it's hard to justify. It. You, you're doing it for satisfaction, obviously, because the labor is intensive. The time it takes to watch that pot boil and... You know, I mean, even at fifth, what's it, fifty bucks, sixty bucks a gallon right yeah, now? Yeah. But even Jeez. still, when I run my numbers, I cook on propane, so I'm yeah, yeah. kind of cheating yep. there. But it's um, it's expensive. Oh, ab absolutely. But I, I love it. I love that syrup so much. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I look yeah. forward to it every year, and and uh, you know, we just have a a little hobby operation at home. We end up making maybe three gallons of syrup every year, and. Uh, it's just a great thing to enjoy with mm -hmm. the family, yeah. uh, especially when it's, you know, mud season. You know, <laughs> yeah, what, else, exactly. what else are you going to do? Exactly, so it, yeah. it's, a, it's a great way to go out yeah. in the woods and, and check things house. out. Yeah. yeah. But going back to the origin story of the hatcheries, initially, just so that people who aren't familiar understand, like the the depletion of the resource initially was, I would, I'm guessing, and based on some of what I've read, a lot of that was industrial, right? It's not like it was people out there with hook and line over. I'm, I know that that was some of what was going on, but there were also commercial fisheries taking place, right? And there were, there was the logging operations, which, you know, deoxygenated a lot of the waters here, right? Changed the waterways quite a bit. So the initial need to stock was that, that was driven. Was it, was the goal to provide a resource then in the 1800s um, for recreational fishing and how much was the recreational fishing impacting the you know how many fish were in the water really yeah i you know i i think the answer to that question is it's all the things you mentioned mm -hmm. plus all the other variables that we yeah, didn't even yeah, talk about yeah. uh you know certainly the the landscape was changing rapidly then um there's uh you know, and, and, and today there's there's still that present threat of, uh, you know, whether it's global climate change, uh, all these all these things that we need to think of as being wild, wildlife uh, and, and fisheries managers. Uh, how is that going to impact, you know, what we're managing? Mm -hmm. um, uh, back then, I, I think a, a big part of it was is that you had... Uh, you also had something that is not legal to do today where you could go out and catch great quantities of fish and actually sell them. Into so the market. a lot of it, right. It was a lot of, a lot of it was market driven. So, uh, you know, you, you look in some of the, the needle books with the pictures of, uh, you know, trains loaded with, with deer and fish and, and moose and everything else. And they weren't sports people that were harvesting those. They were people that did this for a living and they were going down to the big cities like in Boston and providing food for yeah. people to eat. Um, but, there wasn't a good balance, you know, it was, uh, it was not a wise use of the natural mm -hmm. resource back then. Uh, so some, something had to be done. Um, also, uh, a big part of it too, is, uh, we have, you know, quite a variety of species that we raise. Uh, so that's part of it. Uh, if you look at what, you know, the landscape was, uh, back then for, uh, natural fish species, we've we've diversified that quite a bit um not to the extent that i'm saying the that hatcheries diversified it, it or it's they, been diversified 
Yeah, so, you know, for example, like uh, uh, rainbow trout, they're mm-hmm. not even native to right. the East Coast. Yep. Um, Coast they're fish. Right, they're west of the Rockies. Um, uh, bass, uh, both small and largemouth bass, uh, they, they were stocked intentionally in Maine in the, in the 1880s. Uh, so, you know, the, the species makeup changed because, uh, um, because of what people wanted, mm-hmm. right? And that's, that's a big part of it too. So how do you balance that as a wildlife resource manager? Manage for the wildlife or manage for the people? Right, you, right. It's not a 180-degree black and white thing. You have to manage for both. Well, that actually, I want to ask a question about that because I want to get into this operation a little bit and sort of how it works. But first, I want people to know, like, who pays for this? Yeah. And yeah. and how much does what people want influence that because it is the people who who use the resource who essentially fund it if I understand that? For sure. Yeah. Uh so uh I think I mentioned that Maine has eight hatcheries mm-hmm. uh, and they're located throughout the state. Uh there's about 340,000 licensed anglers uh in the state of Maine, so a a lot. Um Wow. Yeah, and when we talk about uh, areas that we stock, we stock about, um, we, well, we stock over 800 different locations throughout the state of Maine. Uh, some areas we intentionally do not stock because there's a native population of fish there, and you wouldn't want to stock that. Um, but fish, if you look specifically at fishing, it contributes uh, over $300 million annually to Maine's economy. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really a big deal. So, you know, a lot of it I've, I've mentioned, the recreational opportunity. But think about all the small businesses yeah. that, that uh, either uh, make a living on or, or get, you know, a boost from folks that want to go out and, and recreate. And whether it's hunting or fishing, uh, you know, fuel, lodging, food, all that, those are the big ones uh, that contribute to Maine's economy. So, you know, $300 million uh, for the state of Maine annually is, is a huge deal uh, and can be directly related to, uh, to fisheries. Um, but, yeah. And so yeah. it's, but the, but the hatcheries themselves, are they funded by license money? Are they funded by uh, outside funds? Is it, is it uh, Dinkle Johnson money? Is, where is that coming from? Right. How Maine is structured right now is uh, the, the, what supports the fish hatcheries and fisheries. Uh, fish hatcheries are funded through the sale of licenses. So fishing licenses. So you know, I highly encourage folks to go out and buy a license. Uh, there's some great programs that have happened in IFNW in, in recent, relatively recent years. Uh, you know, if you know somebody that's uh, a youngster, you can buy them a lifetime fishing and hunting license. I've done that. I've done that for uh, a child, uh, actually. Awesome, awesome. I have mm-hmm. too. I, I've done it for my own kids. I've, I've actually done it for a friend of mine too. Uh, trapping as mm-hmm. well. You know, something that that doesn't get a lot of. Uh, a lot of positive press nowadays, but um, that's how it's funded. So the hatcheries are funded through the sale of licenses, uh, fishing licenses. Fisheries also receive re- revenue from uh, uh, federal revenue. And you mentioned the Dingle Johnson Act. Uh, that's where a lot of their funding comes from. So a lot of people don't realize that when you go out, uh, whether it's at Walmart or the little mom and pop store down the road, and you go out and you buy a fishing rod, uh, there's a tax that's already built into that product. It goes back, it's collected by the federal government, and there's a complex formula, but it's uh, given back to the states based on population, based on license sales. Uh, so you're investing in the exact thing that you're in pursuit of, in other words. Uh, hunting has a similar similar uh, program. If you buy a firearm, you buy ammunition. Uh, that act is called the Pittman-Robinson Act, uh, and it goes back into funding things, um, you know, um, creation of wetlands and mm. maintenance. And uh, um, that's a huge thing right now is access, yeah. uh, getting getting access to, to our natural resources. So, yeah, that's how the funding works. I've been hearing a lot of um, chatter about whether or not there should be some kind of equivalent tax going into the backpacking industry on tents and mm-hmm. gear and things. And part of me is like, well, yeah, st- yeah, we've been paying for this. Like, and these folks are also enjoying these resources and w- why are they not having to pay? But then another part of me is like, yeah, but they don't have a lot of say right now. And if they start paying, they're going to have more to say. 
about how they want to see these resources utilized. So the idea of people who are maybe opposed to hunting, then having a financial stake in it, I kind of, as un, as lopsided as it is right now, I kind of like that because it gives, because hunters and anglers don't necessarily have a very well-perceived voice out in the out in the media world right now. I, I would hate for them to like lose their voice more. And actually it makes me, <clears throat> I'm going to try to articulate this as something I've been thinking about. I haven't said it out loud, but you were talking about before how you could go up and, and harvest fish and game and then sell them commercially mm -hmm. um, before that was banned. And we've interviewed quite a few folks um, in the marine fisheries where you can still do that. Of course, it's highly regulated now. Uh, but it's interesting to watch as we see depletion in the marine environment because resources like um, cod be a really good example. Um, our urchins be another really good example where market forces have led to the depletion of the resource. Okay, so see if I can tie this together. So you've got the anti-hunting, anti-fishing world will get mad when they see you as an individual harvest an animal, even though you're going to eat that animal. And they'll say, well, it's things like hunting and fishing that have depleted these resources and it's actually like no wait a second it's actually folks like you who are buying the meat but not going out and doing it who are depleting the resource yeah because you are paying for it and this is like today they might they buy their meat and fish at the supermarket but in the past they bought it they were the ones fueling that with their dollars so it's kind of an interesting uh thing so today now we go out, we harvest for ourselves. And what's interesting about what you guys are doing, and I assume most of the stockings in the southern part of the state. It's, it's uh, you know, it's it's almost statewide. Uh, there's there's definitely oh, okay. areas that we do not stock in. Okay. But if you wanted to look at, you know, where is the majority of, where are the majority of the fish stocked? Um, pretty much if you drew a line across the state of Maine around Bangor, yeah. you know, uh, south west, of that. yeah, west east line, okay. south of that is for sure, you know, it, it's not the majority of the state geographically, yeah. but it's the majority of where is the stock fish mostly where the people are? It is. Because well, if I look at the back of the Gazetteer, for instance, you can see that population density that's in the southern part of the state and then up the east coast of it, right? That's right. And so I would assume that the habitat degradation where the natural fisheries are no longer really self-sustaining are very influenced by population density and industry in those areas, would be my guess. That That's right. Yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. So, you know, you... you it only kind of makes sense to, uh, you know, to, to have the greatest opportunity next to the greatest number of people. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, what, what you were saying about... Uh, um, you know, about all the taxing and, and that, um, the way that I look at it is, uh, I, I think it's, it's a real good thing for people, people to feel good about that, that tax is built in there, mm -hmm. you know? So if you're in Walmart and you're looking at a fish and lure and you're thinking, gee, six bucks for that, you know, it's a little, it's a little piece of plastic. Well, you can feel a little bit better about it yeah. because some of it is going back to actually help manage that resource. Right. Um, so that's that's a, that's a huge deal, and it, and it doesn't get as much uh, PR as it should. Uh, yeah, a lot of people I, don't know about it. I bet you most people have have no idea that that's mm -hmm. the case. Uh, also, you I know, don't think the anti firearm world understands that because there's such a push against guns right now. And one of the things that I have never ever heard mentioned about this uh, on any mainstream news outlet is, well, then wh wh what are we going to do to replace those funds? Because if we are going to start to push to regulate firearms in a more significant way, there's going to be a major hit to wildlife in the United States. And that has to be made up for big time, big time. Ab absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a huge fun funding mechanism for wildlife. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, no doubt. Um, even, uh, even non hunting firearms. I mean, a, you know, a Glock, uh, you know, a Smith and Wesson pistol, that money still, it's about 11% as I understand it. Your, am your home defense ammunition, never going to see, a hunting scenario still gets taxed in this way. So there's a communities who have been paying for wildlife that don't even utilize the resource. And I think it's a great system, but I just think it's like, a, like you said, not enough people know it exists. Right. Ab absolutely. And, and, uh, you know, one of the ways that those monies can be utilized as well is to, uh, um, you know, increase shooting ranges. Mm -hmm. So a, a place, a safe place to go shoot, uh, you know, to get, to get people into that, uh, uh, you know, that pastime, uh, there's a brand new one that's under construction in Augusta right now because of that. 
You know, oh, so wow. you so you can see the results of, of going and purchasing ammunition or a firearm, knowing that a little bit of that actually went in to pay for that nice brand new range. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, really, really. Is the state, a great the state's way to do building it. that range. The state's doing that one. Oh, yep. that's cool. Um, tell us a little bit about the facility here. Uh, we toured that room over there with you last time, uh, so kind of walk walk this in an I guess you know the listener so they sure. can't see it, but walk through what's going on in that room because it's fascinating. So cool. Yeah, yeah. You guys came at a, a great time of year. Um, so when you enter this building, we're in what we call the new hatchery building, and uh, we have uh, 25 combi tanks, and they're about five feet in diameter, and about three feet deep. Uh, right now, all of them except for one are filled with uh, what we call fry. So uh, that's a small trout that's a couple inches long. Uh, we have rainbows and we have two different types of brown trout that are in there. Um, they started out in there uh, back this past fall, so the fall of 2018. Uh, that's when the, the typical time of year that we spawn is October and November. Uh, we bring the eggs in. And, uh, from where where do those eggs come the, from? The egg, that, that's an interesting that's an interesting component of this. We uh, depending on which fish hatchery you're at and which species of fish you're talking about and strain, so to speak. Um, we keep our, a lot of our own brood stock on site, so uh, the parents to those fish. So we'll bring the eggs in. We'll spawn them outside. Bring the eggs into the hatchery. Uh, what that provides is is kind of like the ideal environment to raise these in. Uh, w- would they be fine on their own if you let them spawn in a in a stream out in in the wild? Yes. Uh, however, the very vast majority of them would be lost to predation and disease and other all natural things that happen. Uh, you know, that's why it's called Marty Stouffer's Wild America, right? <laughs> um, all the stuff that happens out there. So we bring them into a a relatively sterile uh, environment. We utilize well water. Uh, the well water is warmer than our stream water is, uh, or any of the streams are in, in Maine in the winter time. So it allows them to develop quicker. Um, typically, the eggs have hatched out, and the fry are starting to feed around January. Uh, right now, in in April, uh, they've gone from you know just little wait, tiny, wait, wait, wait. tiny you eggs. Describe, you describe the, the, the getting of the eggs. The getting of the eggs. Yep. So that's that's spawning time. I, I hope maybe you guys can come back and uh, check oh, that cool, out. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, uh, labor intensive, uh, but it's it's pretty neat. The other real real cool thing about that is uh, we don't have to kill the adults to get the eggs out of them. Uh, you might have seen on on television uh, or you know Pacific salmon where they spawn once and it's it's a one shot deal and, right, and they right. die after that. Uh, we can we can keep our brood stock for multiple years if we choose to do so and spawn them again next year. But in a nutshell, what it is is uh, that time of year the uh, the the female fish. Uh, have been subjected to the the triggers that make them ovulate, so ready ready to spawn. Uh, so those things are the decreasing water temperature that you see in the fall, and the the two main things: decreasing temperature and de- de- decreasing amount of light during the okay. daylight. Mm-hmm. So the shortening of the days. Um, the water temperature needs to be 50 degrees or less for things to really progress that way. Uh, that usually coincides with the calendar being about mid-October for us. Okay. Um, we don't know the exact day that this is going to happen, but based on historical records, usually it's mid-October. What we'll do is a couple weeks ahead of time, we will go out and uh, we will gather a group of females and we will put them in an, into a, uh, uh, it's a big horse trough, uh, holds about 30 gallons of water, and we will anesthetize these fish. So it doesn't kill them, it just relaxes them. It slows down their breathing. Um, it makes them easier to handle. What do you, is it okay? I, I don't, maybe it's proprietary, but what do you do that with? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a chemical that, that we use, and uh, it, it's we've used different types of chemicals over the years. And it's pretty amazing because you can totally relax the fish, and it looks like you kill them unless you look really, really closely at their gills, and their gills are just slowly moving. Um, It takes them about five minutes to recover, so uh, you you have time to work with them. 
it only takes about a minute or two to actually spawn the fish. It's just done using your hands, uh, sort of kind of similar to milking a cow, but different. You just wring them out a little bit. You basically (laughs) wring them out, yep. Uh, And you got to be gentle, you know. How big are these fish? uh, They they can, the usual broodstock fish is around three pounds, you know, so a a decent sized fish. And seeing them out there, it was really low light when I was looking in in that building out there where you had some of them. But I was thinking, wow, these are trout people would be real excited to catch. For sure, Some very yeah. Very large trout and, in there. And the cool part about that is post spawn, mm-hmm. so after that process I just described, uh, we stock those fish out. Oh, so, okay. yeah. And if you've ever paid close attention in the yeah, stocking report, the brood, yeah, yeah, you can see what we call our brood stock, yeah. our retired brood. Uh, those are the big fish that go out in the in the fall uh, post spawn. That's cool. And how so, many years will you keep them as brood stock? So uh, it depends. Uh, but right here at New Gloucester, we found that actually what works best is, is keeping an adult fish, uh, both the males and the females, uh, to three years old. Um, that's a good manageable size. Uh, it seems to be the ideal, um, age where, uh, you know, the, the size of the egg is, is what we want. Uh, but most importantly, the quality of the egg is, yeah. is like right at the top of that bell So you'll curve. just spawn them out once? We, we that's what we do. Three, take yep. them one time and then they go out into the natural water bodies. Yep, that's what we do here. Other facilities uh, in, in Maine and, and other uh, other areas will uh, also keep them again, spawn them the next year or multiple years. Okay. Uh, it kind of depends a lot on the on the species of fish too. Okay. So going back to it, so now you've, you've sort of, I'm picturing you yep. wringing them out, yep. right? They've got that <laughs> exactly. vent, so all those eggs kind of spill out of there. Yep. Then what happens? Right into a right into a dish pan. Okay, because uh, you need another ingredient. <laughs> yeah, we need another. Usually you need a male, uh, I think always. Uh, and so the males, uh, it's called melt, M-I-L-T, and that's expressed same kind of fashion right on top of the eggs in the same pan. Um, they are just gently mixed together with your hands. So you got one male and you'll have all these females. We No, it's actually a paired mating. So one male and one female. Oh, no kidding. Hey, we'll get right back to the interview in a moment. But first, domesticated, civilized living restricts the natural movement of your human body, forcing you daily into chairs, cars, and rigidly defined pathways. But when we head out on the wild landscapes, we carry these dysfunctional, domesticated movement patterns with us. MoveNat is a natural movement system that trains you and your body to move like a human animal again. Are you interested in building natural movement skills that'll improve your physical capability in the field and in everyday life? MoveNat's new Level 1 Fundamentals e-course is structured to help you re-educate your body using practical, natural movements that enhance fitness, function, and physical capabilities, all from the convenience of your home. Learn to move the way nature intended. I attended MoveNat's Level 1 and 2 trainer certification courses a few years back and came away with practical knowledge and skills that I use every day and that have changed the way I train and move across the landscape, vastly improving my overall mobility, coordination, and fitness. This new e-course is movement-rich with clear instruction. Its progression-focused methodology takes you from restorative mobility exercises to challenging movements. All ability levels are welcomed and accounted for. Enroll now at wild-fed.com forward slash movenat for instant access to the full e-course. Again, that's wild-fed.com forward slash movenat, M-O-V-N-A-T. Again, wild-fed.com forward slash movenat for instant access to the full e-course containing 16 classes designed to be followed over four weeks with specific and measurable movement goals for each week. The course is self-paced and you'll receive lifetime access. MoveNat. I can personally recommend it. It's a fitness and movement system that's designed for the wild. Now, back to the show. Great. And the reason for that is uh, I, there's a lot of science that goes into this. Uh, that is your best best shot at retaining the genetic diversity yeah. that these fish, fish have. Yeah. So uh, the way to kind of think about that is is uh, one male could fertilize all the females that we have. Right. No, no problem. But you'd you know, lose genetic diversity very quickly. Absolutely. Hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of eggs. Or you could have a pair. So one male and one female. And let's just say that one of, something was wrong with one of those two. 
it's not going to be yeah. a loss of hundreds of thousands of eggs. It's only going to be the progeny of those two parents. It's kind of romantic, too. I, I, feel, like, say, I feel like, it's more romantic I feel like my way. wife would get a little tear in her eyes. <laughs> yeah. She'd be like, oh. We <laughs> usually play some soft music. And, yeah. <laughs> some candlelight. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, so that's when life begins, you know, yeah. and then pretty awesome uh so there's there's other steps that happen after that and they go so go through a process of uh called water hardening the the uh egg actually starts to develop a little bit of a shell not quite like a chicken egg but it's it becomes a little more brittle Um, so after you have it in the pan you mix those two together yep the milk and the eggs where does it go after that yep and how long until it starts to get hard yeah, we keep them in a, in a bucket. Uh, there's also a process where we disinfect the eggs. Um, we use iodine to do that with, a solution of iodine. And it's an insurance policy to uh, because the, the parents aren't located in well water, so they're in our stream water. So there's always the chance that there's a virus or a bacteria that's out there. Uh, another note is we actually sample the ovarian fluids, so the fluids that come out with the eggs and the females. Uh, that's sent to our uh, fish health lab, and uh, a whole uh, series of uh, series of tests is, is done on that to see to make sure that they are in fact right. disease free. Um, are there any major diseases you guys contend with or worry about, like um, that you're specifically looking for? Or is this a broad sampling? It, it's it's a broad sampling, but there's there's a specific list of diseases. Uh, something that's familiar to a lot of people probably is something called whirling disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, knock on wood, that's something that we do not have uh, in the state of Maine, and and nor do we want it. Uh, it really decimated a lot of fisheries out west. Uh, so that's one of the diseases that we test for. Um, we uh, so to to move on with that they're now located just in a in a bucket uh, we bring them inside of the hatchery and uh, we we it's called laying them down we put them on a tray uh, what it is kind of mimicking is the gravel in a natural stream but they're on a tray that has wire in it um, you know bigger than a window screen but uh, that keeps these kind of vertically in the water column. We'll set them in either the the uh, combi tanks I mentioned, or uh, we also have aluminum troughs. Just so like an egg sits into that sort of square made by the crossing of the parts of the screen. Yep, exactly. Okay, so the way so it would nest itself into gravel where they would have a their red or whatever. That's right. If you if you picture the gravel and uh, you know a, a layer of eggs on top of that gravel, the water can go around right, and, yeah. and under the eggs and and right. They're not distribute. All sit and clump down in the bottom somewhere. <clears throat> right. Uh, so you know it keeps them from getting covered with silt. It provides sufficient oxygen for them. We duplicate that same process in the hatchery, so it's a way to put a whole bunch of eggs in a small space, but still make sure that there's an adequate supply of water around them. Mm -hmm. Um, on well water which is about 48 degrees fahrenheit it takes about 30 days for them to get to the first stage that you can see with your eye and it's called the eyed stage it has there's two little black dots you can actually see inside the egg and that's that's their eyes developing um we kind of saw that last time yeah i think i showed you guys the the uh preserved specimens that we have uh that, that have eyed eggs in there um and, and there's a whole series of, I'm um, um, kind of skipping a whole bunch of care that's uh, daily mm-hmm. care. You know, we, we see these these eggs every day and, and uh, you have to remove the dead ones. Otherwise, you know, anything that was on there, a fungus will oh, spread yeah. to the live ones. Right. Uh, but after 30 days, you, have, you typically have eyed eggs. Uh, it depends a little bit on the species. It depends a lot on the water temperature. Uh, and then after another two weeks or so, again, primarily dependent on water temperature, they will hatch. Uh, so you'll see little, little uh, clear-looking eggshells one day when you come in to, to check them out. And uh, the process starts very slowly. There will only be a few, few hatching. Um, a week goes by, and it's kind of the, you know, the top of the bell curve for when they're hatching. A whole bunch have, and then it kind of drops off. Um, we move them into a different portion of the tank at, at this that point, point they're like a little fry they are they're they're they called have sack like an fry. egg yeah. sack so they actually leave behind a membrane of you said there's like an empty shell, the shell. yeah so i didn't realize like when i look at a well like a salmon egg mm-hmm. it doesn't appear to have a shell on there right um so there must be some clear membrane and they're, then they 
doff that, but they leave with the rest of the what's inside that. Right. Uh, yep. Exactly. And it, and it's uh, it's just an opaque membrane that you really can't tell when it's oh when it's, it's opaque. Yep. When <clears throat> it's there, uh, but uh, they they hatch. Um, they're called sack fry. They have when you look at them, it's pretty neat because it, it looks like uh, a chicken egg's yolk is attached to this little yeah. tiny fish, and uh, that's a good way to kind of think about it. Uh, they're they're actually uh, hatched with everything that they need to eat. Nor could they eat if you tried to feed them. Mm-hmm. That's just the way things are. It's a it's a great you know evolutionary strategy that when you first come out of the egg, you don't have to immediately look for food you already have it attached to your body. Yeah, you do some growing. <clears throat> It'd be like having a backpack with a with a you know, a, a camel back with sucking through a straw type thing. Yeah, big smoothie in there. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, with all the everything you need and uh it takes you know, again around two weeks for that to be totally uh absorbed. Yeah. Uh then they look like a, a normal looking fry where you don't see that coming out of their abdomen. Uh that's uh, we're getting around, say, the first week of January. So spawn was in October. Now we're in the first week of January. Uh, you have to keep it pretty chilly in there. Just uh, know that you know there's so much water that that's okay. what regulates the temperature. Right. It's uh, we run right now. We're running about 80, 80 gallons a minute, twenty four seven with a, with a pump. So oh, a lot, right, right. a lot of water. So it's not uh, water that's being aerated. It's actually water moving through the system. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I really it, understood that when we were in there. Okay, it's a, uh, and it's actually just a uh, flow through so system. It stays so nice and chilly on it, its own. It stays perfect. Yep. Um, although that being said, if you could, you know, if you had a mechanism to do it, it's cost prohibitive to do it. But if you could re- slowly increase that water temperature up to about 62, you know, that's pretty much if you had to pick a number uh, the prime water temperature for growing trout and okay. salmon. Fastest. The fastest, yes. Uh, we don't get there at, right. at 50, 48, 50 degrees, but it's better than having them outside where, you know, your your uh, wild environment that's iced over and the water's mm-hmm. 32, 33 degrees. But that is how they would do it in the wild. Yes, sir. Wow. Yep. Yep. It's exactly right. Uh, it just is, uh, we, depending on how you look at it, we increase the rate of development or uh mother nature you know mm-hmm. uh, cuts it back so uh, it, yeah. right we you know we have fry in the in the hatchery right now <clears throat> that have been eating since january uh outside uh they would either still be eggs or in the sack fry stage you know <laughs> okay, because yeah. they were they were yeah. dormant for almost all winter due to how cold it was yeah, right. okay um, and yeah. then i'm picturing the the feeding mechanism which was a real simple little motorized yeah thing that just sort of pushed feed over at some steady rate over the edge into the containers, right? Yeah, uh, extremely beneficial because, uh, you know, the, the old rule of thumb is that you can feed fish too much. And of course, you can feed fish too little, uh, but you can't feed them too frequently. So uh, what you were just describing is something called a belt feeder. And uh, it's a it's a clock uh, and it's wound by a, a mechanism. We pull the belts back in the morning and we put on a, spe- a specific amount of feed. Uh, it takes about eight hours for that belt to empty. So before we go home at the end of the day, we pull the belt back again, put on more feed. And what that, what that really does is it allows uh, the fish to eat when we're not right there mm-hmm. over that individual tank. Um, so we, we try to feed them almost 24-7 uh, wow. to, to grow them as fast as we can. Okay. Yeah. And when do they go outside? Uh, and, out, and outside here, let's just describe too, is a series of, I think you're calling them raceways. Yes. I would have called them runs if I hadn't been told that, but it's like a, it's like a step of maybe what a foot or 18 inches. You'll have a little cascade of water. Then another run, they must be 20, 30 meters long or something. Right. So, uh, when they, uh, when they built this hatchery, this hatchery was built in the 1930s. Uh, they chose a great location because it's a flowing stream. So a raceway is just an area where you, you keep and raise fish. And uh, the stream is, you know, it's, it's all gravity uh, supplied water out there. So the elevation is higher at the top than it is at the bottom. Uh, outside, there's no pumping required. We don't have to run any electricity. Um, when they put the facility here in the 1930s, they made use of the topography that was here to allow uh, raceways to be put in. So raceways are just, the best way to think of that, are just compartments in mm-hmm. the stream. Um, 
where we can keep different groups of fish, different species, um, you know, fish that we choose to mark, meaning clip a fin off of them or, or that we don't. Um, it's, a, it's a way to, uh, to manage the environment that they're in. Uh, but usually they go out, uh, we're, we're almost there, uh, May is, is when they'll go outside. So spawned in October, started feeding in, in January. Um, now they're a couple inches long. And uh, what we kind of try to target is a certain size. Uh, we measure, measure fish um, in, in a term called how many fish there are per pound. So when there's about 100 fish per pound, that means that that fish is around two and a half inches long. Um, it's a good size for us to put them outside. The other thing we want to try to do is target when the water outside is uh, at least at or above what we have available inside. Okay. So, uh, you know, once it's uh, 48 degrees outside, we're almost there. Um, we'll move them out and then it'll, you know, get up into the fifties and low sixties and, and the fish will really, really grow very fast then. There's, uh, what, what we have for raceways outside there, uh, we're the last hatchery in the state of Maine that still has just gravel bottom raceways. So, uh, the sides aren't concrete like you would typically see. Um, and it's, a, the good thing is, is it's as natural of an environment mm -hmm. as possible. Uh, you know, when you look at the raceway and then you look at the existing original stream bed, it really doesn't look that much different. Yeah. The only difference is at the top of that particular raceway, there's a uh, just a dam. It's a small dam. And at the bottom, uh, to keep those fish in that one area with the screening material in between. Um, so they, they get a lot of benefits from that real natural environment. Uh, they get natural sunlight. They get everything that's there, uh, you know, hatching. Um, there's tons of caddises out there. Uh, they also become... You're not doing anything to that water to keep it sterile, so right. you're going to have organisms that are in there like a fairly normal stream bed. Ab so. abs it's 100% normal. Yeah. Uh, yep, yeah, there's cool. nothing, nothing that's done to that here. Some of the other facilities in the state of Maine, what we actually do, though, is uh, we use UV disinfectant lights. Yep. That that water passes through? It has to pass through, and prior to passing to that, it goes through a drum filter, so it removes any of the turbidity or anything that might be in there okay. that would prevent prevent the UVs so from that's being like effective. So that's like a home house fit, like a submicron type yep. braided cord or something that it runs through? Yep. Some kind of... Yep, exactly. A real fine screen material is okay. what it amounts to, and and uh, a huge volume of water. You know, at, at uh, you might be talking thirty six hundred gallons per minute at some of the places wow. that we have. Uh, why that's in place is to prevent any wild fish from coming down into the into mm -hmm. the raceways with our fish. Um, so there's lots of pluses to that too. Uh, you know, there's always things that are happening in the wild populations that we don't want to have happen to our fish. Mm -hmm. How quickly will they go from that two and a half inches or hundred was a hundred pound, hundred fish per pound you said? Yes, sir. How yep. quickly do they go from that until they're that size that they're ready to go be stocked? A, a catchable size. Yeah. Uh, usually, uh, trout and salmon grow about six inches a year in the hatchery environment. Um, and most of our spring yearling brook trout, um, a spring yearling fish is a fish that's a year and a half old. They're, most of those are right around 10 inches long. So okay. six inches a year is, is a pretty good guess on how quickly they, they grow in length. Something I hadn't thought about till we visited was once they're out there, of course you're dealing with predation. Mm. And... Uh, we saw, you know, today when we pulled up, there must have been 25 crows came oh, yeah. ripping out. Did you see that? You hear that? I didn't see the crows. Yeah, oh, man. Yeah, it was a ton. Making a racket. Um, a murder of crows. A murder. A murder. That's right. Good, good uh, memory. <laughs> so in addition to crows, what what are, what are the predation situations like and, and how how much effort does it take to keep that at a sustainable level, I guess? A, a lot, especially here. Um, uh, Greg Massey, uh, one of the guys that works here, he's out stocking fish right now. Uh, he said you saw seven individual great blue herons here last night. Wow. Trying to get in. Wow. Um, that's not the all-time record. Uh, 
for sightings of, of birds. There's, there's a whole bunch. And, you know, they come here, uh, they're migratory, uh, thank goodness, because our situation here, we have predator control nets that we put up over the raceways basically now through uh, about Thanksgiving when there's a chance of snow. Those this predator, doesn't ice over because it's it does. That, okay. It actually does, does ice over from, for uh, a couple of weeks at a, at a time. Um, but we can only have those predator control nets up when the threat of snow is non-existent. So uh, uh, we put them up just as soon as we can, and it seems like the herons know, and, you know, they start showing up just a few days before we get them up, and uh, they have a field day out there. Uh, great blue herons are the main predators. Uh, osprey. Uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember if we saw one when you guys were here. I don't think we did, no. There was, maybe I'm thinking of another group. Yep. Uh, they'll just come down and, you know, it's, cool to see but right, right, right. we, we get a lot invested in these fish and <laughs> i, I want to go catch it i maybe don't want a to dingo <laughs> yeah. you, maybe yeah uh, they come by now the osprey carries them vertically right they They'll do carry they, a fish off vertically yep. as opposed to a horizontally like an eagle yeah yep and uh eagles on a regular basis and that's that's We're getting a that's lot of eagles in the state at this point big. i mean i was driving the other day there was one on the side of the road about 20 yards from my car just watching me as i went by and when I was a kid, I just never, ever saw them. And now yeah. they are everywhere. Yeah. It's awesome. It's it's really cool. And when I was a kid, um, I, I lived near Swan Island in, in Richmond, Bodenham area. And it was a huge deal yeah. to see an eagle. And that's one of the, the last places that they had a foothold. Um, what really sent them for a loop was uh, uh, the pesticide DDT. Uh, so it started weaken making their eggs, weaken right? their eggs, fragile eggs, and and uh, they not successful hatching. And uh, but Swan Island's an awesome place to check out, and you can see these huge nests. You know, we're right now we're sitting at a table that's a few feet across, and and the nest would occupy the wow, the whole yeah. area. They use yeah. the same nest every year. Oh, do they? Um, yeah, didn't know that. But uh, other other predators too, mink. Uh, yeah, maker, your fur bears, most. big, yep, fur yeah. bears, uh, otters, uh, yeah, yep, absolutely. They so, can be kind of nasty. Love to see huh? an otter crawl up was, in here. I was telling Greg that yeah. I, you know, when I see them in the wild, sometimes they get real hissing and barking, and they they can be kind of nasty. They're feisty critters for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, and you know you can't blame them because yeah. it, it's so Sports easy <laughs> to catch a fish here compared yeah. to out in the wild. Right. Uh, you yeah, know, you could specialize in this. Yeah. What about raccoons? Raccoons don't really bother the fish. Uh, they, you know, they, they eat frogs and that type of thing. However, uh, we have had occasions in the, in the, um, you know, a little later in the year than it is right now, um, when the mother will bring the little ones out. So say in June and in July, uh, and along the sides of the raceway, it's just an earthen bank out there. And when we feed our fish, we feed our fish by hand. So we carry a bucket with a, a can in it and we toss the feed into the fish. Inevitably, we accidentally drop a little bit of feed on that bank. And uh, the raccoons will just get in there sometimes, and it looks like you took a rototiller uh, through it just, just to try to get, <laughs> yep, try to get those little pieces of yeah. fish food yeah. that are there. What about do you? Maybe not so much now, but do you ever have anybody sneaking in here to try to fish it? Okay. Yeah. Because yeah, if I do. worked here, it would be you a nightmare. Do, really? dude. I would be yeah. really bad. I know I would be really bad because I would want to – I just want to catch them just yep. to have that feeling of a fish on the line, you know? Yeah, I know you would. It's, it's uh, <laughs> you know, one of the – we have seen that happen, and, and uh, the, some of the security measures that we have in place, we have an alarm system uh, – we also have staff that actually lives right on site, so oh wow, we, yeah, we we keep a pretty pretty tight eye on. Yeah, that. I noticed just driving into the the signage, you know, because the gate was open, and mm-hmm. the impression that I got from the signage was like, "Come on in if it's open." If it's not open, you better have permission because if you don't, we're going to prosecute you. And then you have that sign that says, uh, Your GPS is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you guys are, are the only folks that have ever read those signs. Uh, <laughs> honest to goodness, because uh, the reason we put up the, the uh, no throughway signs, which are the latest editions, is uh, uh, everybody's following their phone in their car now, right? Mm-hmm. You know, they, they turn that on, they use that as their GPS. And for some reason, it wants to send folks from nearby Route 100 over to Route 26. 
uh, thinking that it's a shortcut or, or a time saver or both. It's not. And our road is not the best. It's, you know, it's, it's not a... It's not a public road. It's right, a private right, road right. for the fish hatchery. So we, we try to deter uh, through traffic here. Right, right. About. Yeah. And uh, it, the last couple of years, it's a, it's been a big problem with yeah. a lot of cars coming in. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that's just going to get worse. Huh? It is. So it you've is. Had, you have had kids sneak in here? We, we have. Yep. Unfortunately. <laughs> Yep. With a net or a rod? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> just laying a gill net across one of those raceways. We can't talk about them. They're, they're no longer with us. So. Yeah. Fish food. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I guess uh, so from from that point, and we'll, I guess we'll get to see a little of this today. The fish are, oh, I, you know, just going back, anything you want to close up on? I want to hear where they go after where we've left off, but anything else you want to say on the predators? I mean, do you do you guys trap shoot? We do. How about you got to do a little all bit of all above. of that? Huh? Yep, we trap. Uh, we we actually have a uh, uh, from the from the federal government um, <clears throat> a depredation permit uh, specifically for avian predators, so the great blue herons. Uh, it's a last resort. I was going to say know, we, the federal government must not hand those out too easily, huh? Right, and it and it has to be uh, you know it has to be a just cause, and and uh, they do a good job with administering that program. You have to document uh, all that pretty well. I bet. You have to document it all. You also have to have uh, tried everything else possible um, mm-hmm. before you end up lethally, uh, you know, killing a bird um, if it's causing damage. Do you have like? I assume you would have particular birds that are pro- like a, a problem bird it, who just won't be deterred. Yep, and that's the ones that usually end up that yeah. happens to them. They, they, uh, find, they we, find the depredation tag. <laughs> we we try and yeah. and uh, you know uh, once the the predator control nets are up, they do a pretty good job. There's a tremendous amount of maintenance with that though. Uh, they'll you know they'll find a little hole and they'll keep pecking at it and make it bigger and try to get in there and get a fish and get out before nobody notices. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that we've had some repeat offenders over the years. Uh, there's, there's a heron, um, it's, uh, it's been named Cornelia that was probably, geez, I don't know, it's got to be four years ago now. Uh, and, uh, it was inside our net and, uh, of course, IFNW is not only are we responsible for the, for the propagation of, of fish, but we're also responsible for managing great blue herons. Uh, so, uh, one of our biologists came down and, and, uh, put a transmitter on the, on the back of this bird and you can track it online. Uh, just amazing. The distance that this thing goes, migrates. Yeah. Very, all that, all that new emerging technology tracking, uh, very, it was a little backpack transmitter, GPS. Yep. yep, Very cool stuff that's, that's happening. Cause, uh, you know, otherwise you don't, they're, they go, but where do they go? You don't know. Can you imagine like, cause I know when I have my backpack on, mm-hmm. you know, like I know, yep. I know you sit down in a chair, you're yeah. like, oh, I got a backpack <laughs> on the weight of it over time. Like for a bird, it must just, it must I always be, wonder about first, animals. At least it must yeah. be super annoying. <laughs> like when yep. you see like a big, you know, neck collar on something. Just, yep. So interesting. Think about how a moose feels after it sheds its antlers. Oh my goodness. You know, right. Uh, huge. I, yeah, huge I can't even imagine the and, yep. size of some of those racks and how quickly they grow too. Um, so th- the fish get, to that size of about, I think you said about 10 inches. How many is that to a pound? Yep. Uh, so a, a 10 inch brook trout, uh, is about 2.5 fish to the pound. Okay. okay. So we right. don't actually cut them up to make that. <laughs> right. Half, right. That's half. good of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why we do that and use that unit of measurement is, uh, it's the most efficient way to load our stocking trucks. So ahead of time, we've done a sample count to figure out, okay, are they 2.5 fish to the pound or are they 2.3, 2.6, um, that way we don't have to count individual fish. We do it by weight when, and you guys will get to see that today too. And then once they go out into the water, you know, you, it's just fascinating to me again, like I'm, I'm picturing somebody who, like I said before, they look out there and they think, Oh, this is the forest that's always been here. Not knowing that how much the baseline has shifted in the last, let's call it say 500 years, which have been a really dramatic shakeup to this part of the country or this part of the continent. Um, the idea that a truck is pulling up and dumping these fish into the water, I mean, just, it's like kind of shocking, you know? Right. Um, when those fish get in there, like, what do they do? How are they similar and how are they different from the wild fish? And what are the interactions like between the wild fish 
and uh, these fish who've been raised here in the hatchery. Yeah, that's that's uh, all great stuff to talk about. Uh, one thing that you know I can say for sure is is people often ask us what is what is the survival of these? You know, mm-hmm. so is is the program successful? And rightfully so, you're invested in it, so you want to know, you know, is this going to make a, a a difference or not? Um, and when you uh, see how they're transported, you might think, geez, you know, isn't that isn't that being, uh, um, you know, how can they survive that, that whole process? Uh, well, we do the same thing right here at the hatchery. So uh, when we move them, we have two lines of raceways. And when we move fish from one side to the other, they go through the same process. We put them on the same truck, we load them the same way, and we offload them the same oh, okay, way yeah. as when we go stocking. Uh, so you actually not only get to see immediately uh, were there any mortalities associated with that, but you also see a week later, month later, a year later. So, you know, anything yeah. that's even long term. Yeah. So, uh, Or if there was some internal injury and, you didn't right, see. Show right, right. And, and right. fish, you know, are one of the things that that can happen to. When you, when you catch a fish, uh, you know, and, it, and it's bleeding a little bit, so it's like, well, you know, it's a legal fish, but I think it's going to live. I really want to let it go. What should I do? Should I keep it? Let it go? I don't know. It may die, you know, it, but it might not die immediately. It might be a day or two later. So there's, there's, uh, I've heard it can be as high as like 30%. Sure. Uh, you know, know, there's, really. there's delayed mortality. Right. So just because it swam away doesn't mm-hmm. mean that things oh, yeah, are all... you take a bullet, you know, to the, <laughs> to the gut. I mean, you might make it two and a half days, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Days. Um, but it, the, the process that we use to move our fish, fish, transport them from the facilities, uh, uh to the bodies of water, uh, is without a doubt extremely effective and, uh, doesn't cause mortality. I couldn't believe it when we saw, to care. we saw how many trucks pull up the day we were here. I think there been, three or four. Oh, that's right. You guys are yeah, here then. Yeah. And they're yeah. coming down that, I mean, like down a drain and yep. through a big tube, right? It must be a fun town fo- splashdown. Uh, yeah. Yep. That's what it's, that's what it's <laughs> like. And I'm watching a volume of fish that I've never even seen before. I mean, almost like when you see like a big purse net or something like that, empty out onto the deck of a boat where you're like, yeah, yeah. it's a, just a shocking amount of fish. And then I was expecting a lot of them to be floating up, and the, I think we maybe saw one, one dead fish out of. We saw thousands. Of yep, that fish. was uh, that was over fourteen thousand fish that day. It was wow. five Whoa. five truckloads of, of fish that came over, and I'm not I'm not saying that uh, you know we don't accidentally kill fish. Yep. <laughs> Step on uh, them. They yes, they get when you're in with you have to be in with them, so you're wearing your waders, and uh, you know when they're in a small confined area like that, it's very easy for you to inadvertently step mm-hmm. on them uh so you know we always tell folks make sure you shuffle your feet like frankenstein <laughs> if you don't take your foot off the bottom they can't, can't get, get under, under your yeah. foot mm-hmm. um so uh we you know we do everything we can and and uh but yeah. that's user error not errors that's in right. the system which is good yeah. that's right yeah it's it's a really a really good system that we've had uh it's been around uh you know it, it's evolved too uh but it's been around for for many many years it used to be uh, a lot different back you know we were talking historical stuff here um they used to transport them in in uh, old milk cans you know that you would see pictures of uh yeah. so you could only put how many fish how many brook trout would stay alive in that thing for an You're hour talking about probably those big steel yeah. ones those 10 gallon size ones? yeah you know you could probably maybe put five or ten fish in yeah, there yeah. um nowadays uh you know the the trucks that we have they're uh, they have aerators on them. Uh, we also have the ability to, to, and we do use oxygen from time to time. Um, so in a, in a very, you know, relatively small footprint, say a, say a four by four cube, uh, you know, we, we can haul upwards of 150 pounds of fish in that one little wow. area. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's amazing. And so like I was saying, when they get out, are they, perceived as natural fish or are they do they sort of segregate themselves from one another yeah so that's you know that's a that's a big thing and how do you how do you answer that question and and uh just because what you see at one location Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they they always behave that way so typically what will happen is post post stocking fish uh for a day or two and that's kind of an ish, you know, it's not a guarantee. Uh, the fish that we stock will tend to stay in that area. 
um, more so in lakes or ponds, non-flowing waters. Uh, flowing waters, they really seem to dissipate a lot very quickly. Everybody goes and finds a position. Right, right. Okay. Um, but in, in non-flowing waters, uh, you know, they, they're still figuring things out. So it's a different environment. You know, hey, how come I can go deeper than uh, three feet? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, that's a big thing to me. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, y- you know, they're trying to figure all that stuff out. Um, they they have the inherent uh, instinct as well, like like most fish, that, you know, there's safety in numbers. So I think that's a big part of it is, uh, you know, let's stick together on yeah. this one here for yeah. a bit till we figure out what's what. Um, <clears throat> then it's the interaction with, with, uh, you know, what is there for other, other organisms, you know, fi- so fish that are already present, <clears throat> uh, and, and, you know, how, do, how does that work? It, it really, I can't really answer that question because it, it depends on a lot of factors. I was just thinking all the predatory fish in the water, I would guess are, these would be easy pickings the first few days, at least as they were getting their bearings. Is there any way to know how much predation? Yeah, happens? yeah, and that's you know that's a lot of uh, the the jobs of uh, fisheries biologists is to is to get a handle on that you know so how so once they're in the water the everything's passed on to the biologists you guys are done there it's back to the hatchery to get working on that's right yep okay. e- exactly uh, so you know it's a whole evaluation process whether it's using uh, trap nets or uh, you know, the creel surveys that we mentioned, uh, electrofishing. So, you know, you're going out there to try to find fish and, and get a handle on uh, how well they're, they're doing uh, and then make recommendations on, uh, you know, what, what could be stocked there in, in the future uh, to improve that. <clears throat> uh, kind of getting, getting back to uh, the interaction of post-stocking with other fish, you know, we realize that, and a lot of things we do are with the realization that, hey, you know, okay, you're stocking fish, but there's also, uh, it might be instances of uh, largemouth bass or, you know, um, I hate to bring up the uh, the invasives. I wish they weren't here, and uh, but, you know, they're there, and are they eating the product that we just put in mm-hmm. the, the spotty water? Uh, in, in recent times, what we've tried to do is to uh, stock a larger fish than what we have in the past. Uh, well water has gone a long way to, to help us out with that. Um, years ago, uh, you know, many, many years ago, there were more fish stocked in the state of Maine, uh, numbers-wise. Uh, right now, we stock about 1.2 million fish a year. Um, <laughs> but recent years have been the heaviest by weight that okay. we've ever done okay uh so you know the fish are more there. weight less fish right ex- exactly uh so you could go back and look in the you know 50s 60s and and you might see some of the old stocking reports and you'd see three million fish stocking state of maine it's like wow well yes but they a lot of those were only two inches long so you know by a little more uh, defenseless when they get uh, on the environment. absolutely everything can eat them you know, absolutely everything can eat them. So that's a big part of it. Another kind of neat example relevant to what you're talking about is uh, uh, we mentioned stocking fish uh, from our fish stocking trucks to the body of water. Uh, but certain areas throughout the state, we also uh, do something called boat stocking. So uh, the, the stocking truck will pull up at the boat launch and a uh, fisheries boat will come along with a tank built into the boat. We'll transfer the fish from the truck to the boat, and that boat will transport these fish out into the middle of the lake. So avoiding, say, a narrow, uh, heavily vegetated channel next to the boat launch where all the predators are are waiting. You don't want to drop them in the gauntlet. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. So at least take them to the other side of the tracks, (laughs) and uh, they can make their own decisions from there. That's really funny. Um, I want to talk about sort of... I, I, from, from, again, from my reading, and I think some of my reading has been a little bit biased too, but there's been, there were some mistakes made in the history of the hatcheries, right? With regard to, um, either putting, like you mentioned before, some of the fish that are invasive here were not, you know, done by the local folk with the, with a five gallon bucket, but were done by the, by the state, right? Um, some of those have had caused major disruptions to, ecology in some areas um what are the mistakes that have like what were what are the big mistakes that the department or the this i guess you know 
the hatchery looks back on and goes like, oh, those are the, man, how, why did they do that? Like, what are the big mistakes and what are the lessons that have been learned from those? Yeah, you know, great, great question. Uh, when you were bringing that up, what comes to my mind is uh, the stocking of the lake trout, otherwise known as togue mm-hmm. in Maine, in Sebago Lake. Yeah. Uh, so, and, you know... <laughs> You could argue, was it a mistake or not? So the reasoning behind it at the time was, and we actually mentioned DDT earlier, speaking about how it's detrimental to eagles. Um, that also is de- detrimental to a lot of different populations in Maine. So, uh, you know, it, it, anything that, that bioaccumulated that, it just it decimated them. So what happened at Sebago Lake, you know, the famous Sebago Lake, Sebago Lake Salmon, uh, is it decimated the salmon population? Yeah, the landlocked salmon landlocked is, salmon. is yep. uh, Salmo Salar Sebago. Very good. So it's, it's name. trinomial name comes from that body of water, which now, just for people listening, if I understand it, now we stock salmon there, and the togue, which the lake trout, which were stocked, are now a reproducing population that are not stocked, right? That's so right. So it sort of reversed the whole thing. That's right. Okay. So the the native fish that were there, the salmon that you just mentioned, uh, good job remembering the scientific <laughs> name, um, they were in a huge decline. The The salmon fishery was just, just horrible. So something, something had to be done, and uh, what was done was to stock lake trout into Sebago Lake. You know the old saying, "Hindsight's twenty mm-hmm. twenty." Uh, that's, I think, the best way to view that. Oh, they're just trying to keep fish in the lake, no matter what kind of fish. Right. To you know, to have okay. Well, gee whiz, you know, isn't isn't our all aren't all the guides and the local uh, you know mom and pop stores? Uh, how are they going to be able to make a business mm-hmm. if nobody's coming to Sebago Lake to recreate in the summertime now because mm-hmm. the fishery is collapsed due to DDT and the problems associated with that. So um, lake trout are introduced there, and the problem is is, is they've they've uh, they compete much more with the salmon than I think uh, what the biologists originally thought they would. So um, I, I think that that's a good example of something that could be viewed as a mistake. And it, it sort of is thought to be what led to the decline in the salmon population there, or the their ability so, to right. spawn. So right. So today, you s- now salmon, you know, are, are there. DDT is banned, so we don't see the effects from that. That um, was affect. DDT was affecting the salmon. Yes. Yeah. I so didn't realize whole, that. The whole so, so, food so the, stain, food uh, chain, uh, all the way up through, and you know that. Something wow. had to be done. So the salmon population was decreasing rapidly, so they introduced a lake trout. To, to create another fishery. Another fishery. And yep. then they started uh, hurting the salmon population as well, even more? That's that's right. So now you have, uh, you know, and that's a great way to look at all the invasives. So what are invasives? Those are fish that we don't want here in the simplest terms, right? Um, what comes to mind are species such as pike and crappie. Muskies, uh, no. probably two, yeah, and muskies, and certainly in northern Maine. Um, so uh, you know, the easiest way to picture that, and I think for the the general public to understand it, is uh, you know, you go to a pet shop and and uh, you buy a couple fish, and then you're looking at the other fish there in the pet shop, and gee, that one's really cool. I want one of those, and this one's really cool over here, and I only have one aquarium, and the the guy at the pet shop says, you know, no, you don't want to have those together, and you're like, oh, I'll do a good job. I'll mm-hmm. feed them and, you know, give them the best of care. Six months later, you only have one big fish, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> now, that's that's an oversimplification yeah. of yeah. what's going on in the wild right now. But uh, anything that you throw into the system that wasn't there to begin with is going to have some effect on it. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge deal now. But it's it a really lot, is. you know, it's like having a big bird nest in your reel. It's like trying to sort out all of the interconnected strings in the web of ecology Mm -hmm. as takes generations, right? As we just, I feel like when I read about the fisheries today, it seems like people are just starting to get a handle on some of the very complex interactions between species, right? So then it was much less well understood. So what is the, what does the future look like, um, for the department with regard to stocking? What are the things that now we've been through, well, like you said, the, the DDT thing happened and Silent Spring came out yep. and there was a revolution in understanding about chemicals and what we do to the environment in that regard. Uh, we went through the sort of 
the save the whale, you know, environmentalism wave, and that's changed things a lot. Um, we're at this place today where participation numbers are down, and and the public's view has changed with all of these different forces working, uh, creating obstacles, um, w- and changing methodologies. What what is the thinking moving forward with regard to how the fisheries and the hatcheries interact with the wild ecology? Well, actually, that's pretty unfair to say for you guys, too, because you're not really dealing with wild ecology, you're dealing with a massively man-made infrastructure that the public perceives as the wild environment, right? But, but how has all this stuff, all these lessons learned, uh, what's, how is it changing the direction that the department's going with these programs? Yeah, it, it's a huge balancing act, you know, and it's ever-changing. Uh, you know, you, the times that you put something behind you, something new comes up, mm-hmm. uh, and you have to be able to adapt and, and, uh, uh, change to that. Um, so it's a constant issue. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we are, we are, uh, you know, actively trying to get, and I'm, I'm biased. I, I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like to do all these things we're talking about, um, I also want my kids to do it too. Mm-hmm. You know, I want their friends to do it. Uh, I, I can see how it's, it's a good thing to do. And, and, uh, so I think with, uh, you know, with education, uh, it goes a long way to, um, getting, getting folks into the outdoors that haven't been there before and keeping those folks that have done it and stopped for whatever reason, um, getting them to come back. Uh, and then also keeping your, your current, your, you know, mm-hmm. user too, yep. uh, along with balancing the, the desires of uh, the non-consumptive folks too. You know, we, a while back there we were talking about taxing and, and uh, if you have a canoe uh, and, and you don't have a motor on it, um, there's no registration. There's, no, there's nothing that you mm-hmm. uh, have to do, nor does anything contribute to what you're utilizing so mm-hmm. um you can use that boat launch but the guy that has to register his boat because he has a motor on it is one of the folks that helped fund that boat launch mm-hmm. um so it's all those you know it's it's a whole bunch of stuff uh how are birders not paying for any of this yeah, it makes yeah. no sense right they're they, going out looking at the ducks we're paying for it. <laughs> um yeah that's funny yeah because the non-consumptive user appears to be the the bigger growing demographic um by a long shot um who are your biggest critics? Uh, geez, you know, I, I, I guess I'm just really lucky. I, I, I don't, it's, yeah. it's extremely rare Good. that okay. I hear the critics. Okay. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this for, for a while now, for the past 20 years, uh, and I can only think of probably two occasions when uh, somebody saw us out in a particular area, we were stalking fish, and they weren't just ec- ecstatic. Oh wow! You know, it's like, wow, that's awesome, and and uh, I'm gonna go tell my buddy, yeah. and you know, just just fantastic about it. Yeah. Um, so we're we're fortunate, and uh, you know, that's one of the things I I love about my job is uh, we're we're actually producing a product. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, and and putting that out there. Uh, you know, it's something that's tangible. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I think the shift that I've had in my mind is seeing the hatchery is less of, um, so some playing some role between nature and farming. It's like somewhere in, in the middle of that whole thing. Who's your biggest supporters? Uh, I think fishermen, you know, Mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, definitely there's, uh, you, you know, you get to know certain, certain individuals and, uh, they're the folks that you see every year and they're asking, yeah, you know, kind of a late start this year, isn't it? There's a lot, <laughs> yeah. when, when are those fish going to be going yeah, out? Right. Uh, and that's, that's all great. You know, yeah. I, any, anybody that's into this is, is just fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, you know, folks that fish, no, no doubt. What's your hope for, um, what's the, the legacy for you when you pass this sort of job on in the, you know, in your future, what do you hope for the future of this organization of this hatchery itself and, and the, the job? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I would love to see more funding, uh, go to the hatcheries. Uh, I, I personally think that, uh, we would be much better off stocking way more fish than what we do right now. 
Um, and I think you would re, you would see an even bigger return on that investment than we currently see right now, you know, which is considerable. Um, lots of ways to improve, but it all takes money. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's getting folks involved in it. That's why I'm I'm so glad that you guys came here today and uh, you know took your time and and I can tell that you're genuinely interested in this. Uh, and and spreading that word, you know, that's that's what it takes. People people only protect things that they're interested in, and a lot of folks don't even know about fish hatcheries. Yeah, and that that's okay. But uh, the more folks that do, the more invested that they get in it. Um, you know, the the more funding that we can get to produce more fish, higher quality fish. Uh, that that's where I hope things go in the future. Awesome. Well, thank you for sitting down with us today. It's oh, been you bet. Very enlightening, and uh, we're excited to get out there in the field and, and see some of this for ourselves. Any, awesome. Uh, any uh, just thoughts? thanks for having us, Tim. I nope. appreciate it. <clears throat> very welcome. I'm, I'm psyched you guys came here. Great. It's sweet. All right, let's get out there. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.